Dave. June yeah. is gone and is sure cut awake. <laughs> yeah. Boy, is that not the truth. I, I think that's been the the roughest month in, in Plastic Model Mojo history as far as getting our recording done and timing and then everything interfering with it. I don't want to top that for sure. No, no, that that's right. You know, no more tornadoes, no more windstorms. I don't want to lose power again. That was not pleasant. Well, let's let folks know what's up. We dropped uh, episode 93-ish uh, with Dr. Strangebrush <laughs> recently. And uh, basically, we truncated that episode and took most of the core segments out because, one, we didn't have them done yet because we ran out of June. And the segment with Dr. Strange Rush was uh, fairly lengthy in the format we chose uh, with the questions and stuff. So uh, we're going to roll that into the 12-minute model sphere. And uh, this is going to be something more like the hour and 12-minute model sphere. Yeah. What do yeah. you think? I, hey, works for me, man. You know, like I said, I, nothing nothing I like better than sit, sitting around talking models. Well, we'll certainly do that, Dave. And in the keeping in keeping with the theme of TMM up on the front end, July is is not going to be quite as busy. Thank thankfully, but folks will be glad to know that uh, of the two episodes coming up for July, the first one's going to be a Return to the Wheel of Accidental Wisdom. Yes. And that's proven to be popular. And we've got a big, fresh slate of topics on the wheel. And uh, our Ottawa friend, Ian McCauley, is going to join us in the third chair for that episode and uh, take on the wheel with us. Well, I'll tell you what, I always enjoy those. And man, uh, the listeners have been sending suggestions left and right. I really enjoy those. And episode, the next episode, let's see, that would be what? That'd be 90. 94. 94, and then uh, 95 is going to be the one that drops just a couple of days before we dash off to San Marcos for the National Convention and uh, just off the confirmation hotline right now. Uh, it's going to be you and I with uh, Panzermeister 36 in the third chair. Um, <laughs> t- topic to be determined, but uh, I'm sure we'll talk about our pending uh, travel plans and uh, what all we're looking forward to, and we might we might – work some other topic in there that uh, would be suitable. So uh, have we decided yet if Evan is riding on the roof of the vehicle or in the trunk? Well, that will depend on what he eats along the way. Okay. (laughs) Well, in keeping more with our normal episode format, I'm going to jump right back to uh, the model sphere thing, Dave, Uh, since uh, all the uh, harangue around the, uh, Last episode, has anything changed? What's been up in your model sphere other than your other than what you talked about last time? Yeah, I've I've ordered a couple of books. Uh probably take them on the drive with us down to San Marcos, maybe get a little reading in. Between our uh plastic model mojo dojo and uh Facebook Messenger, a lot of good interaction, which that really serves to keep my my mojo flowing. And uh, it is, man. I'm just the the only question is uh, how quickly is the nationals going to get here? Because I'm I'm just, you know, I went to the bank the other day and I took all the rolled coins that I, that I save all year to turn into extra money for the for the vendor room and turned them all in and got got cash. So I'm ready. How about you? Uh, I'm I'm ready for that. We'll talk about that a little later. In that segment, but uh, a couple of things came up this week that, uh, you know, as far as my own modeling journey are concerned, it gave me a little affirmation and perspective. And uh, it was kind of interesting uh, of those two things. The first one was, uh, and, and you got this too, we got the current issue of Amps Boresight in the last yep. week or week or 10 days or something like that. This, uh, this issue was the coverage of the 2023 Amps National Convention. Now, where was that? That was in Pennsylvania somewhere, I think. Yes. Uh, and f- from that recap ep- issue, I got I got kind of two things out of it. Um, the first, after seeing the summary of all the AMPS Masters winners, it was apparent that uh, I've not, and possibly you haven't either, we've not attended an AMPS Nationals in way too long. I uh, know. We're going to correct that next April. Uh, I hope so. We need to rectify that. And, uh, yep. L- luckily, their, their venue f- for the next one is... Uh, going to be convenient for uh maybe uh we just get dropped off by robin and she drives on up to to uh 
St. Joe, Michigan and hangs out with her friends for the weekend. <laughs> hey, that, that works for hey, heaven. Robin is the chauffeur would be great. And uh, we need to talk to them about getting a table for that show if we can. Yes, we do. The other thing out of that issue was in, in that same summary was seeing Charlie Pritchett's name for his Iraqi T-72 from the 2002 show. Yep. I remember that one. 21 years. Yep. Which folks have heard me talk about before and talking about me having some downtime in the hobby and coming back. Uh, that model hedged out my SU-76 for best of show. Yep. Uh, literally came down to a show of hands. Yep. But by the judges involved and that was cool in its own right. I, in its own right, I was sure like to have, to have won the best of show, but I didn't. Um, and then that model was kind of representative of a paradigm shift that was going on in the, in the hobby at the time, as far as, at least as far as armor modeling is concerned. Yeah. Uh, and the profound effect it had on my modeling. I think pre that presaged uh, the changes you've seen start there and bleed over into all of the other as, other genres of the hobby be it sci-fi or aircraft oh, yeah. or i mean I so. the armor was leading the way in that regard but all, of all of that i think most importantly was how insignificant all that seemed now based on <laughs> my change of attitude this podcast and uh, kind of the, the different uh, philosophical direction i've been going on for uh, well since we really started the show since i got you're, back into this you're on a journey I'm on a journey. I'm next a thing you know, next thing you know, Kwai Chang Kane is going to come along, and yeah. you go walk across the desert together. <laughs> uh, the other thing that came up this week was Model Geeks episode fifty-eight: How to Keep the Hobby a Hobby. So this kind of meshes with what I just talked about from the first thing from the Amps Amps Borside issue. Um, specifically, in their episode fifty-eight was Scott Samos' comments um, when they got to this special segment of theirs and. Uh, you're just remembering uh, the hobby being more fun when when he was a kid, you know, growing up in it, learning the new stuff, getting better along yep. the way. How awesome it all seemed! How awesome all the models were when you got them done. Only to get to adulthood with a mature skill set and then start to battle being demoralized by not achieving your self expectations. <laughs> yes, a- absolutely. Oh. That is the thing that that I I constantly think about is it's a hobby. It's supposed to be enjoyable if you are putting pressure on yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with striving to get better. No. But if you're putting pressure on yourself, you're doing hobby wrong. Well, I appreciate it. So, Scott, thanks for that. It, it, it kind of served to make me know I was I was doing it right finally, or doing it right for what I need to be doing for myself. Good. All right. Well, that's what I got. Mike, uh uh, what's your modeling fluid tonight? Well, believe it or not, I'm back on the bullet orange. Oh, really? I saw that yeah. on, I picked some of that up. I saw it on sale. That's, well, guess what I saw it on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what caused me to buy it. It was like twenty two ninety five a bottle. Our friends group here in the neighborhood's got a game night like once a month and uh, it's our, our turn to host. So, uh, we needed something, so. I grabbed that along with a few other things, but uh, that was the bourbon. We didn't okay. drink too much of it last night, so I'll have a little tonight. Not too You've much. You've got plenty left. That's right. What about you? Well, my modeling fluid, because of the weird, the the again, we're July 1st, but still feeling the effects of June and uh, the weird recording schedule that we're still dealing with. My modeling fluid is a glass of Big K orange soda. Oh, uh, I've, I've got to I've got to drive to pick my wife up when we're done recording this, and so uh, because my of my strict no bottle to throttle policy, uh, I'm 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 drinking a soft drink, but. Sometimes, sometime later, I will I will be uh, switching over to something a little more adult. Well, that's all right. You're responsible, Dave. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, well, if that's it for modeling fluids, Dave, uh, we got a pretty good mailbag. There's some good stuff here. Good. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'll, I always do. <laughs> it's funny. Um, Michael Karnaka was 
um, feeling grateful that he got to have two two of his questions. <laughs> and I think the last time we did listener mail, right, <laughs> or maybe the time before that, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, something happened. I think well, I guess it was this episode ninety three. We ended up not doing listener mail, so we skipped him again. So I got two again. So guess what, Mike? You get to book in the listener mail. One more time, at least. So this is kind of testament to our jacked up recording schedule over the month of June, if it, if nothing else. And Michael wants to know, have you ever been super excited about an announced kit, but were put off from buying it due to the price when it was released? When I was younger, yes. I'm I'm kind of at the stage in life. I'm comfortable enough that really price isn't a big deal. As far as I go, now there are some things that, you know, I'm not interested enough in to pay the freight. I'm not going to pay what seven hundred ninety nine dollars for the thirty fifth scale Dora or whatever. But that's just because <laughs> I don't have enough. I don't really have that much interest in it. But uh, you know, within reason, price really doesn't bother me nowadays. If it's something that I really want, how about you? It's that mad lawyer money, Dave. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not that good. Uh, that's a good question. I I get a little heartburn with like the newer dragon stuff. Well, not of none of it's new now, but you know, they've been re-releasing stuff. And I don't know. I, they're they're just uh I don't see how they're gonna be competitive with some of this other stuff that's out there. Maybe they will be. Maybe maybe they don't care. I don't know. But I'm trying to think of an example of one where I just was like, geez, uh, no, thank you. Um, I don't think so. Because I used to buy some expensive resin kits back when that was the cool thing to do. And- <laughs> well, not only that, you didn't get the nickname Mr. Guns from shying away from expensive kits. Uh, no. You were, you were dropping bank when you were much, much, much younger, younger many, <laughs> many was. years ago. I- I think now maybe I don't buy as much. That's true too. Just because of the size of the stash and what I have. Uh, yeah. I, the number of, of kits that I buy in a year is clearly gone down from what it used to be. And you know, there, there's probably people out there that, that if they're just starting out or if they're younger in life and if they're younger in life, they're just starting out. If they're new in their career or whatever, and, right. and uh, they don't have a lot of extra income to throw around for whatever reason, um, yeah, I can see. You know that that kind of puts off the stash building. When when I was in law school, man, I was eating ramen noodle. I mean, we, we've all been there. We've all been to the to you know at that point in your hobby where you're walking into the hobby shop and you don't have a lot of money on you. So you're much more selective in thinking about, do I really need this? Do I really need this now? Is this worth the price to add to a stash? Which is never the plan, by the way. The stash yes, is no, never the plan. Right, that's right. It, it just sort of happens. <laughs> right. I've never met anybody who got into this hobby with the intention of building a stash. Yeah. I think I'll pile up hundreds of kids. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'll age styrene like it was fine wine. <laughs> Not sure it works that way. But. I don't think it does. <laughs> up next from San Antonio, Texas is Kevin Patrick. And uh, this one's funny because I think it, if it had it been in the listener mail in the last episode, it would have made a little more, well, it would have just meshed a little better. He was, he was asking about, uh, Strain and clear coats, which I think Doctor Strangebrush talks about yep. in uh, in that episode. So, Kevin, he, he may have mentioned you by name. I don't know if you asked him this directly or not. I know he brought it up. It was a topic we discussed. So, go back and check that out if you hadn't. Um, and then he references episode ninety with Steve Houston in the Water, Snow, and Ice episode, and he was talking about pouring epoxy resin and. You know, after the pour, sometimes these little bubbles can appear near the surface and. You can take a you can take a torch. Yeah, I don't know if he's using like a plumber's torch or a creme brulee torch out of the kitchen or what. Probably a creme brulee torch because those and, are really uh, fine. And just uh, momentarily hitting the top of that, and uh, it says it takes care of the bubbles. Yeah, man, I don't know if I had the 
cojones to do that or not. <laughs> yeah, well, you let's put it this way. If it's somewhere way far away from the model in the pour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's what I was thinking. N- not a problem. But if you're starting to get close to styrene, man, styrene has a melting point that just that that that, yeah, that, that, that would start start to worry me every 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 bit of that flame is well in excess of the melting point of styrene exactly (laughs) and then he's got a final lament about modeling subjects uh he says there's no and he doesn't mention scale but uh the air force t-37s yeah the little tweety birds Yep, a tweet and says there's like 1300 of these produced and we're in u.s service for 55 years all we've got some old kits or old A thirty seven variants. There's no T thirty seven. Yep. No, that, that's right. They're in seventy second scale. There's a couple of them. Um, I'm thinking Academy and Hasegawa, if memory serves me right. But but yeah, they are the A thirty seven variant. And uh, uh, but I, I don't think in thirty uh, there may be one in forty eight scale. But I don't know if there's. A, I'm sure there's not any in thirty second. Well, I have to look that up. What? What's the A thirty seven variant? Is it a the, well? The A thirty seven is the attack variant. It's a right, a, right. It's a little side by side trainer called the Firefly, or not Fire Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Yep, yep, yep. And yep, uh, that's right. And uh, the trainer variant. And then once they you were using it as trainer, they thought it made a nice little ground attack aircraft. So they had they had a uh, ground attack variant and. I think they sold them to some people, some countries as well. Another one from Texas, man. Mike Stucker. I hope we get to meet all these people. Yeah, absolutely. From uh, Sugarland, Texas. He says he knows Agent 003 has been telling us about a bunch of places to visit while in San Marcos and the surrounding area, but he doesn't think he's mentioned a place to stop while traveling to the Nationals by car. I, oh, I know what's coming here. Uh, anyone driving to San Marcos needs to stop at least once to Bucky's Convenience Store. I knew that was coming. Now, the one closest to uh, the show is in New Braunfels, which is 15 miles southwest of San Marcos, which is probably the direction the least amount of people are going to be coming from. Yeah. But um, there are plenty of Bucky's on the way. In, you know what? I, we, I, looked, I, I looked at this. We yep. won't hit. We will. We will not hit a Bucky's on our route until Dallas, Texas. I figured that that when we hit Dallas, we, we would hit one for sure. Mike, let me tell you why I'm, and probably Dave too, are a little familiar with this. Uh, as luck would have it, uh, last year they built a Bucky's on I-75 in Kentucky, down in Richmond, Kentucky, which is about 20 miles, 25 miles south of where I sit right now. Uh, it's been there about a year. We've been down there a couple times. And also, I think there's probably four on I-75, including that one. Yes. And uh, two in Georgia. Well, there's one on I-40 in Crossville, Tennessee. So they're moving east on on the major interstates. There's one. There's supposed to be a new one being built on 65 uh, somewhere in Kentucky, south of Louisville. I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, I think it might be around Bowling Green. So if if the time of day is is uh, advantageous, uh, we'll roll in there and near in the Dallas metro area and. Uh, yeah. Let Evan see a Bucky's. There you go. <laughs> Get him some beaver nuggets. Get him beaver nuggets. That's right. <laughs> and a t-shirt. And take his picture with Bucky Beaver. Oh, there's one from our friend, John Vickis, who's uh, currently in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yep. And uh, he's just throwing us a compliment, Dave. You know, he just finished episode 92 and his app queued up episode 16 after that. Oh, wow. He's just complimenting on the, on the sound quality and the evolution of uh, the improvements. And uh, he says it's kind of gradual and unnoticed as we go along, but uh, it was juxtapositioned against a, a recent versus an early episode. And uh, it was quite apparent, apparently. Well, a lot of that's thanks to the listeners who are Patreon or PayPal contributors because the equipment upgrades, the software upgrades – None of that probably would have been possible without those folks. So uh, if if you hear improvements in quality, besides being attributable to uh, Mike's ge- engineering genius, it's uh, much much of it is equipment software related. Thanks to thanks to you listeners. Next, we have Jason Campbell, and 
I think he's in Tennessee somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. I just, I, this this email is in reference to the recent show in Knoxville. Okay, where the where a couple of Gundam clubs stacked the stacked the category pretty pretty stinking full. Yep. Well, he's there's talk about he says because of that, um, actually adding some divisions to that category. That's it. That's interesting. I think that all clubs from invitational contests to regionals, even to the nationals, you are going to see Gundam categories added and then not just a single category. I think that there will be enough demand because it is extremely popular. I mean, you walk into, there are some hobby shops you walk into where 75, 80% of the kits are Gundam kits because they're real popular with the youths, as they say. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. And that's a well, good development. It is a good development. And they're going to think and they're thinking they're going to split between clean builds and weathered builds as the, their first foray into dicing this up a little bit. Yeah. And see, that's the thing. We're going to have to get input from the Gundam community to know how to split. IPMS had this problem with many, many years ago with the automotive community in how they, they split their, what their categorizations were, were totally alien to IPMS and IPMS initially tried to impose an IPMS decided version of categories that were that were totally foreign to automotive modelers and it took us 10 12 years to get that to get to get it through our heads that this is the these guys area and we need to take the <laughs> input from what, how they divide themselves up as far as categories and contests. And we finally gotten it uh, in IPMS at the nationals. We finally got that solved, but it was, it was a struggle. And I imagine we'll see that same, hopefully we'll have learned a lesson from automotive and we'll, uh, we'll, as the, as Gundams become more and more popular at the Nats, we'll see those categories built out with the input of the builders of that category. <laughs> uh, next from Charlotte, North Carolina, our friend, Bob bear, the voice of Bob, the voice of Bob. Ah, he's talking about episode 92. Okay. Where we talked about prepping for Nats or is that 93? Yep. That was 92. No, 92 was prepping for Nats. 93 <clears throat> was Dr. Strange. Bro. See June just completely discombobulated me. I, man. You and me both brother. I thought we had a good plan, but just life. Got <laughs> well, we all did. Away. It did. It did not meet. Con survive contact with the enemy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> In this case, Mother Nature, among other things. Hey, like <laughs> who do you quote, Mike Tyson? <laughs> That's right. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> well, we got punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Repeatedly, he says. He says, "Great idea for a show." And I think I mentioned this last time. It's like. Uh, I don't know. I kind of felt like we phoned it in. I mean, when we, when, we, when we took it on, you're like, I can talk about this for hours. And it's like, it ended up being a short episode. <laughs> well, I could have gone on. I was, I was trying to keep it to the most interesting stuff, but I've had numerous people interact off of that episode and suggest and, uh, Jim Bates, uh, after he listened to that episode, he, he said that the, that the first thing I mentioned was the shoes. He said that's the first thing that he would have have talked about, and you'd never have thought about that being a big <laughs> issue going to the Nats, but it is. He says, no doubt Dave is, has all the insight with his experience. This will be number three for me, still a rookie. Well, well Bob, I'm not <laughs> – I've been to three, I guess. No, I've been to more than three. You've been to more than that. I, I, I can still count them. I still can't use all the fingers on both hands. Right. I've not yet been to 10. Yeah. Getting close. But there are few and far between. Until recently where they're we gone every year. Yeah. Which is something the podcast has done, which is good. My record straight was 13 straight years. And then that's the one you missed, 14. And then I missed 
one. <laughs> Compression socks. <laughs> yep. If you're someone that rubs the heel, it's a good idea. He has yep. some real thin ones that work great in his attempt to stay mobile. That is that is true. You know, again, we are not a our our, our demographic. Although we're bringing in lots of new modelers, <laughs> you know, our demographic does tend to skew a little bit older. So you have to think about those things. Compression socks yep. is a good idea. Long pants, man. There you go. Yeah, long pants. Yeah, you roll in there looking like pippy long stockings, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a problem. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> People will point and laugh. Extra suitcase. He's got a large canvas suitcase that rolls up into his main suitcase just in case yeah. he's on the case. That's a good idea. Dave has cash. No need for an ATM. <laughs> what, what's this bender you speak of? Well, <laughs> technically it's not a bender because it was only a half a day thing. It wasn't like a full on don't eat drink too much uh it was uh young mike keeping up with uh, a couple of our patriarchs from our club yes uh, who, who were uh, hardened veterans <laughs> and livers too probably yes <laughs> but mike lived to, t- to tell the tale and what a sad tale it is dave yeah yeah you you were green for about half a day on that one yeah don't do something that makes you green for half a day at the show you're there to have fun don't have yep. it all on the first night yeah, ruin the rest of it. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Stay hydrated. Average humidity is about fifty percent in August. It's going to be a dry heat in San Marcos. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you know, pictures, cameras. Be careful. Don't don't be stupid. Don't drop yes. your phone on somebody's model. Yeah. And his last points: modeling fluid. We got to figure out what we're going to pack for the trip, Dave. Uh, since we're driving, we aren't we aren't l- as limited as we were, say, in Las Vegas. Uh, I I suspect that we will have an ample, ample supply of various modeling fluids. All right. Well, Bob, come share it with us. Absolutely, Bob. Can't wait to see you. Ken Beckler. Uh, I think he's from one of, them, one of those Polish Coast Watchers. Okay. He is. I'm pretty sure. Peoria yep. area. Yep. Volvo guy. And a runner, too. So we got a lot in common. Oh, man. Uh, he's got a book recommend a book recommendation, Dave. Which is maybe you've got it. It's an Osprey title, authored by Mark Chambers, called "Wings of the Rising Sun." Yes. Yeah, uh, and it's a. Uh, I guess it's a book about uh, the recovery of Japanese aircraft and bombers for uh, evaluation. Yep. You got that one, Dave. Yes, I do. Yes, is I it, do. Is, is as good as Ken says it is. He, it is a very good book. Of course, the the Osprey titles, you know, there's some that are better than others, but they rarely, rarely do a bad one. So that's you know, that's true. That's true. I, I think I got a couple of bad ones, but that's for <laughs> that's for another time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then finally, on the email side, is Mr. Michael Karnaka again for the opposite bookend. All right. I think we might have had this as a wheel question, but hit, we'll, we'll, hit me with we'll, it. We'll do it again. Uh, what can't you ever see yourself building, or modeling, or building? Um, because of the the handshake thing, uh, miniature painting. Though I would love to do it, is probably not possible for me. I've built a car before. Uh, I've built a sci-fi before you know i don't know that there's something that i just can categorically say i won't build anything in that genre ever now there's some i'm more likely than others sure but if i see something and it really interests me uh, who knows what 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 tickles your fancy at some point i think i'm i'm similar at this point it used to not be that way I, you know i just was all armor all the time for all those years. And I, and you know, it's still my main focus, but I mean, I got this E16 on the desk, I, the, the gun in my build, I probably would not have built that had it not been for the Moose Root cup, but you know, now it's not outside the realm of possibility of doing another one. Maybe someday. Right. I don't know. Why not? Well, not um, only that, but having built it, you have a, an appreciation for that part of the hobby that you did. Sure. Have before. Absolutely. That's true. At all. That's absolutely true. 
So I don't know. You look at my stash. I got a bunch of real space stuff back there because of my new yep. job. Uh, I've got some, a uh, lot more 70 second skill aircraft. I've got uh, something else. What would it be? Maybe it's just the aircraft, but uh, none of that. <laughs> it's kind of shameful. That's all been bought and since 2020 probably. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the stash question. That's that's okay. That's okay. No shame, brother. We're all no. we're all we're, we're all we're all plastaholics here, man. All right. Well, I don't know, Mike. That's uh, I think at this point we're we're pretty much open. Without delving into you know dioramas of people doing bad stuff and uh, right. things like we talked about a little bit last time. Uh, I think uh, most subjects are probably on the table at least a little bit nothing's outside the realm of possibility i agree well dave anything on the on the facebook um a number of things have been up on facebook uh leaf lee fogel who won the prize in episode 93 uh messaged me because he got to hear his name on the on the podcast so it was just a hey night that's great and thank you Listener named David Williams from Smithville, Texas. This is a Texas themed episode. He's a Navy veteran, was uh, in VS 32 in Desert Storm flying S 3 Vikings off the USS America. And uh, one of his squadron mates uh, recently passed. And so he reached out because he wanted a recommendation on a top end bourbon that when the squadron gets together at their next reunion or whatever, uh, can toast him with. And uh, since he said Top End Bourbon, I recommend it. If you can find the Weller Green Label, nobody's going to have a bad experience with it. Was sorry to hear of his friend's passing, but uh, that's that's an awfully nice way to uh, uh, pay your respects. Hopefully you can find it. Oh, I hope he can. I hope he can. Might be easier to find it in Texas than in Kentucky. That's what I was going to say. It probably is. Thomas, Car- <laughs> well, you'll like this one. Thomas Karen reached out because he's got the old Hasegawa 72nd scale catapult and plane. Now, he doesn't say which one he has because there are actually two kits that Hasegawa released both with the catapult, one's the Alf, one's the Jake. So I don't know which one he had. But he wanted to build up a section of uh, Japanese ship deck to to put it on for display purposes. But he said he had no idea how wide the planks would be or what they would look like. And so what I recommended is, first of all, take a look at the Anatomy of a Warships book on any of the Japanese cruisers, because uh, those things are just fantastic. And uh, I also had him send me his email address, because I'm going to hook him up with uh, uh, Jeff Inchai Groves, who I am pretty sure will probably uh, supply him with more information than he could ever possibly want to know. Well, after I return his books to him. <laughs> well, I, you know what? I suspect <laughs> I suspect that he's still got a lot on the subject. Okay. But, by the <laughs> way, Thomas is from uh, West Valley City, Utah. So that broke our that broke our Texas streak. Well, we got two from Utah. Yep. Tommy Choi, who supplied us with the triptych. Uh, uh, I think my space and I think my spaceship knows a way. Which way, beer? Uh, reached out because he had heard of, obviously, he had heard me reference it as the modeling fluid. Uh, and then just coincidentally, a buddy of his was at a food truck and they happened to have that particular beer and uh, the friend sent him a picture of it. So it was a nice uh, synergy going on around that particular beer. <laughs> And finally, Wayne Lorimer, uh, he's from Greymouth, New Zealand, so completely on the other side of the world. He reached out because he's building 72nd scale aircraft, and he's going to take take a shot at riveting, doing adding riveted detail to, in this case, an Academy uh, Corsair F4U1, and he wanted to know 
how to do it, you know, whether to do it before the kit's assembled or assemble the kit or what the techniques are. Well, since that's not an area that I've yet challenged, except in very small uh, ways when simply restoring a little bit of rivet detail that I've erased, um, this is another one where I got him to send me his email address. And in this case, I'm going to uh, hook him up with Barry Numeric, who a couple of years ago started riveting, fell in love with it, and now rivets basically every aircraft that he built. So hopefully uh, Barry will be able to answer all his questions and give him uh, a good amount of guidance. You couldn't have a better teacher than Barry. Uh, he's his his stuff is just freaking amazing. So, Ooh, man, I'd want an extra kit. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's the nice thing. The Academy Corsair is yeah. cheap, cheap, cheap. So, I I suspect that if he messes it up, first of all, you can just sand it off and redo it. But in addition to that, you, you know, if you really bugger it up. You can throw it away and go get another one, and you haven't. Uh, it's not like you've messed up a fine molds phantom or anything. <laughs> so, I still got to get one of those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's all I've got from Facebook Messenger land. This is the point in the episode or the mini episode or whatever we're calling this thing uh, where I ask you to, when you're done listening, if you haven't already rated us on whatever podcast app that you listen to us on, if you would go to that app and rate us, we'd ask you to give us five stars. It drives up our um our visibility and new new listeners are discovering us every day. So a lot of you are doing it. I appreciate it. And hopefully you'll keep it up. In addition, if you listen to us on a regular basis and like it, and you've got a modeling friend, somebody in your modeling club, somebody you interact with online who doesn't listen to the podcast, we'd appreciate you recommending us. Uh, a recommendation from a friend is the single best way for us to grow the podcast. And uh, we're trying to do that. We're, we're continuing to grow and we want to find new ways and new avenues and new listeners. So if you do that, we'd appreciate it a lot. And once you've done that, Please check out the other podcasts out in the model sphere, and you can do that by going to www.modelpodcast.com. That's model podcast plural. It's a consortium website set up with the help of Stuart Clark at the Scale Model Podcast up in Canada. And uh, there you can find banner links to all the podcasts who are participating in this spirit of uh, mutual cross promotion. Uh, you can go to that site and go straight to a bunch of other podcasts related to scale modeling. So check it out. In addition to podcasts, there's a lot of other content out there on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of other blogs, a lot, of, a lot of YouTube channels out there from some friends of ours. Uh, Dave, you already mentioned Jeff Groves, Inch High Guy, all things 70 second scale, has a wealth of information, not only on his blog, but uh, he'll help you out if you need some uh, need some information. <laughs> yes. And, and you can watch his amazing batch builds where he builds, you know, five to 12 of the same aircraft or the same family of aircraft it's amazing yeah jim bates scale canadian tv uh youtube channel interesting take on the hobby and uh all the all the things around in the model sphere and, and is he coming to nats or not dave he is coming to nats he's up in canada right now and uh he's shooting video i'm pretty sure that hopefully by the time you listen to this episode he will have dropped a new youtube video so go check out uh a scale Canadian TV. Also got Stephen Lee, a sprue pie with frets, a great blog dealing with all things around the hobby, be it uh, philosophical, be it builds, whatever. Stephen's got a great, a great blog, long and short form content. Please go check that out and uh, be a regular reader there. And uh, we keep talking about getting him back on and we got yes. some open slots coming up uh, in the fall and we're going to have to figure out where we're going to get him on here, Dave. Yep, absolutely, man. He has been kicking butt lately. Uh, just some great content. So, Definitely go take a look. 
And our friend Chris Wallace, model airplane maker. Now, he's busy moving right now, so he's probably not doing a whole lot. But <laughs> Other than harassing you and I online through Facebook DMs, but that's, that's, that's right. nothing new. But check out his YouTube channel. If you're, especially if you're an aircraft modeler, you're going to like what he's doing there. Yep, absolutely. Once he gets that model, uh, model room set up in the new place, we're going to have him on and have a big in-depth discussion on that. And we can't forget Evan McCallum, Panzermeister 36, YouTube channel. Uh, if you're into building armor, weathering it, and want to know what's up with the latest 3D printed tracks, check out Panzermeister 36 on YouTube. Yep. And uh, you and I have gotten a few pictures from him uh, recently. So we, I think, are getting a preview of something that might show up in an upcoming video. I'm, I'm going to be interested to see it. If you're not a member of your national IPMS organization, IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, IPMS Israel, IPMS uh, Mexico, whatever, please consider joining the national organizations. Do a lot in communication with each other. They also provide structure to all the local clubs and help promote uh, contests. They're, They're a bunch of guys who are giving up some modeling time to make the hobby experience a little bit better for everybody. So if you're not a member, please join. Also, if you're an armor modeler in the U.S., well, although it's not limited to the U.S., I guess, you can join from anywhere, uh, AMPS, the Armor Model Modeling Preservation Society, is out there, and they have an organization devoted to armor modeling, And uh, they put out a a magazine, and they hold a national contest, which is going to be in Indiana in April of next year. And Mike and I are going to make a real effort to go. So Google them, look them up, see if you're interested. All right, Dave, let's have a word from our sponsor. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. Come and make it in Texas, Dave. We're getting close, buddy. We are. At the time of this recording, Dave, we are 32 days away from the 2023 IPMS National Convention in San Marcos, Texas. God, I'm ready to head down there tomorrow, man. I'm just, I'm I'm itching. I think we could because we are prepared. The hotel is long since booked. Yep. The rental car, hopefully a van. Let's see what we get, what we ask for. Yeah. Is all set other than possibly adding you as a driver. We probably need to do that soon. Yep. We got to get you and me and Evan both added as drivers. So uh, there's no way you can be able to do 15 uh, and a half hours. No, there's not. <laughs> uh, registration is complete. I'm pre registered. You're pre registered. Yep. Hopefully, Evan's pre registered. And if you haven't pre registered, uh, it's too late. Yep. They closed that ended, it out. That, that closed out on June 30th. So if you have not done that, uh, again, it's too late. Uh, you're going to have to stand in line at the show to do it, but you can still do it. It's just, right. Uh, it just takes up a little time. You don't have the luxury of walking in there and telling them your name and uh, turn around and walking off with your packet. Yep. I think, Dave, all we got left is to pick up Evan at the airport in Louisville and uh, pack the cooler. Yep. And I'm I'm telling you what, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've got my suitcase open and I'm actually starting to put stuff in it. So <laughs> uh, I've not I, done that yet. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, it's my favorite four days of the year. I just can't wait. The guys in San Marcos, I mean, that's a a story of overcoming adversity because they were supposed to do it in 2020 when the pandemic hit, and they had to scramble when it ultimately ended up being canceled. So, you know, these guys guys have not only gone through this once, they've gone through it twice. And so... (laughs) Um, I'm really looking forward to it. When you get there and you see the guys from San Marcos, thanks, thank them for putting in the effort. All that said, uh, we do have an update from a Mojovian Special Agent 003, Mr. Brandon Jacob. All right. And, uh, he wants to go back and talk about Green Texas a little bit more. Now, I think mm. we've mentioned this before, but he's got a little more detail. Okay. Uh, he wants to highlight one more time Green Hall. 
It's located in Green, Texas. It's about, uh, let's see, about 15 minutes uh, from the show venue. Spell green. G-R-U-E-N-E. G-R-U-E-N-E, Texas. But it's green. It's green. (laughs) I don't know if Texas is green. Maybe parts of it. (laughs) Green Hall is an iconic destination. It's the oldest continually operated dance hall in the state of Texas. And uh, it's been the home of so many uprising bands. Uh, some already big, big acts come and play there from time to time and return of the roots. It was built in 1878. And again, it's the oldest continually operated and most famous dance hall in Texas. 6,000 square feet, Dave, mm-hmm. Hi- high pitched roof. The original layout exists. They still have the side flaps. They can open it up to the open air for uh, open air dance when it gets hot. You and Jim may have, depending on who's playing, you and Jim may have to make a pilgrimage over there, uh, you know, with with your back and forth, back and forth musical references. That well, might be the, something to see. Yeah. The genre might be a problem, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. They got a bar at the front and the lighted stage in the back and a huge outdoor beer garden. Uh, you can go to greenhall.com for the full calendar. And he noticed that uh, the current calendar includes uh, the evenings during the show. Their national convention. Good. We'll have to take a look at that. All right. So it's just yeah. Again, fifteen minutes from the convention hall. So if you need a if you need a sidebar destination to get some cold beer and uh, check out a historic place in in that vicinity, check out Green Hall. Calling back to episode ninety two and you know prepping for the nationals and all that. One of the things I did mention there that really bears repeating is. Don't just trap yourself in the convention hall itself. There are all these different places where the convention is held, and each one has its own unique charms. Um, You know, Las Vegas is Las Vegas. Uh, You know, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, obviously there's tons of good beer and German uh, heritage and all that. Each, Each little place that they hold the national convention is a chance for you to see a a different part of this really big country. And if you do that, if you don't do that, you're going to miss out on something that really does make your nationals experience more memorable. So I, I'm urging you, if you go to San Marcos, don't just eat in the convention hotel restaurant uh, don't just go back and forth between your hotel room and the convention. Go out and try and experience a little bit of what the location has to offer. You'll, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Well, I'll second that. It's Get out and explore a little bit. you got yep. time to do it, especially yep. late afternoon before dinner. Go out. Go out for dinner. Yep. Check the place out. If it's not a place we mentioned, find another place. There's, I'm sure there's tons of places to check out that you've never been to in San Marcos, Texas. So uh, give it a little uh, consideration. Dave, it's the Benchtop Halftime Report brought to us by Tackett Z. Tackett Z, the must-have tools for the model maker. You can check out everything Ed's got going on at www.tackettz.com. What's on your bench, man? I know what's well, on your bench. You know Give what's on update. my bench. Everybody, everybody's getting tired of hearing of it, hearing it, and hopefully you won't get have to hear it much longer. Uh, I'm pushing on everything else has been pushed aside. I'm pushing forward on the F8. After we're done recording tonight, I'm going to start decaling the wing. Things are are moving forward. Uh, I've just I've got some time crunch, and uh, I hope I'm going to make it. We'll see, but. Uh, I've got to say, the one thing I've done on this kit is I'm using nothing but the Mr. Color paints, which is the first time that I've ever used them for an entire project, uh, including the Mr. Color clears. I've got to say, I understand why so many people praise them so highly. They really, really, really go down well. They're rock hard. The colors are beautiful the spray you thin them with, with unicorn tears and and they just behave themselves uh better than ever any acrylic or enamel i've ever sprayed so they may have converted me over we'll see so what have you been doing uh, i'm back at the bench sort of S- slow going but i'm easing back into things uh after vacation and just some 
general not being able to get to the bench. I've, I started the oil paint work on the Japanese catapults. Yeah. Going slow kind of resulted in a pause after a couple of days work in order to order a couple of uh, additional oil paints. I wasn't liking what I was getting with what I had on hand. These are all the Obtilung 502 paints. Uh, so I picked up a couple more from Burbank's House of Hobbies. And uh, we'll talk about that more at the end. But, uh, you know, I ordered those things and three days later they're in my in my mailbox. So game is on again. I've been blending away over the last couple of sessions and uh, it's it's going slow, but it's going pretty good. Well, let me ask you, you say it's going slow. Is it going slow because it's a slow, tedious process and you don't imagine that in the future you'll get faster at it? Or is this something where there's a lot of learning going on and therefore once you experimented here, you anticipate doing things like this in the future and having them move much more quickly? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's going slow because I'm I'm learning what I'm doing. I don't know that I have a good vision in my mind about how what I want this to look like because not only is it techniques that I'm I'm still trying to get a, a grasp on, it's a subject I've never modeled before. And I think it's like uh it's like stumbling around your house when the lights are out. <laughs> you you sort of know where you are, but you're still not <laughs> quite getting where you want to go that's as easily good, as you would if the lights were on. <laughs> that's a good description. <laughs> Uh, another thing is, um, you know, I guess it was last weekend we were uh, we were online with our little group with our Canadian friends, and I was working on a T thirty four turret I've got as a paint mule, mm -hmm. and uh, I was just doing the same kind of oil paint work on it, just just really just playing around, and and heck, three hours later, I ended up with a turret I was pretty proud of, and wishing I had a tank to put under it. <laughs> so is that one now go, going from paint mule to putting it in a box? And uh, No, because I, I slap dashed it together. So it's, it's not, oh, okay. it's not, it's not really worthy of it other than it looks pretty good paint wise at arm's length. It looks great. Uh, it doesn't hold up much past that. Well, you know that uh, we talked to Steve and he, he talks all the time about how much time he spends experimenting compared to how much time he actually spends building and painting the actual model that he's going to ultimately finish. And, you know, I, I see the wisdom of that more and more, just as I see the wisdom of building well, quote unquote faster or more regularly. I'm, I have told you before, I'm convinced that if you don't airbrush regularly, you lose the skill and I think that goes for other areas of modeling too. So, well, where I was going with this is that turret's green, right? And my catapult's gray. Right. I'm finding gray by comparison to be kind of hard. Huh. I would have thought that gray, because a lot of a lot of the weathering you would do would be black, dark gray, or rust colored. I would think those all would go well and be easier on a gray background than, say, trying to weather using those same colors on a green background. Well, I think with the green turret, because the color is already so saturated, the base coat, that you can you can be a little more heavy-handed and get those to blend out and feather out and completely go away if you don't like it. This gray, that this... this Curie Arsenal gray. It's you know, it's not a dark gray. It's not right. A real it's a, light gray. a mid gray, and it's it's pretty neutral. I mean, it's pretty right in the middle. It's not real cold. It's not real warm. So you can shift it to brown or blue really easily if you're not careful. Gotcha. And I, I found I can I can wander off into a place I don't want to be pretty quick. Hmm. So that's, that's why it. I ordered the other oil paints. That's because. That that's interesting that the background color has such an effect on, say, your the not only the colors you use for weathering, but the weather, the techniques you use and the intensity. I've got a lot of experience with green yeah. in an armor modeler. Maybe right. you know, maybe that's something coming into play. I, it's maybe subconsciously I know the complementary colors and shades and what I can get away with and, and what effect they might have on the model. Right. Uh, this this gray is kind of a whole new 
ball of wax. And uh, <laughs> uh, I just got to be careful and, and go slow. Well, I can't wait Maybe. to see you start masking and painting the actual airplane. Well, that's next. I'm getting reacquainted with the Paul. I've been had it out on the bench and seeing what needs to be done prior to painting. Make sure I've got everything on the model I want on it when I paint it and all the stuff I don't want on it. Yeah. Is uh not on the mo- not only not on the model, but I actually know where it is. Yep. <laughs> so Those, I don't and, come up missing and, later. And you know what? I, I don't think armor modelers have to think about that quite as much. Because in general, other than maybe some antenna stuff or that, everything gets put on the model before painting. Whereas when you're an aircraft model or you're modeling an aircraft subject, you actually have to think about, all right, what stuff do I want to attach to the model before painting? And what stuff do I want to paint separately and attach after? And the list is pretty long sometimes, depending on your subject. Well, you know, it's, that kind of plays into, I'm trying to develop a painting plan. Whereas with an armor subject, it's pretty much a serial thing. You do X, Y, Z in that order, typically. Right. With the airplane, not so much. I, I got to, you know, we've already talked about what's attached and what's not attached and and not much more to say there. But for the finish I want on it, there's going to be some pre-shading involved. I'm going to do a little of that before I spray the primary colors on the plane. Uh I need a masking plan, not just the canopy, but, uh, you know, there's the, the yellow leading edges of the wings. Right. In a big scale, it probably was a soft edge demarcation between the green and the gray. Right. It is, but in 70 but seconds, in 70 scale. Second scale, it's not so much. So I got to figure right. out how I want to do that. And then I got some delicate stuff to mask over how I'm going to do that. And then yep. just, uh, what else to attach? You know, I got to check the fit on the canopy and see if that's going to be on or off when I paint it and all that stuff. Yep. There's a lot to consider. I'm telling you. Uh, See, aircraft modeling is a thinking man's game. I guess so, man. So (laughs) this man's got to get to thinking so I can get that one, get that one finished. You got it. Anything else from you? No, that's it. So Mike uh, got to got to wonder what uh, what spending you've been doing lately, model wise. Uh, what broke your wallet? Vacation broke my wallet. <laughs> Other than that, just two tubes of oil paint, so fourteen dollars total. <laughs> not not much, Dave. I, I think uh, I know what you're doing. You're saving for the show, and I yes. guess I kind of am too. And. I'm I'm well into my current projects. I don't need to buy anything for any of the things on my bench right now. So I'm not spending any money before the national convention. So yep. I think we're going to just change course here and uh, go back into a phase and yawns because there's been some stuff released. Yes, there has. There's been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff getting announced. I'm telling you. So what, what, uh, What's attracted your eye? What fave or yawn have uh, you been looking at? Believe it or not, it's uh, it's Larry's Maki MC two hundred full gory thirty second scale. Oh my god, <laughs> that's such a beautiful airplane. Oh, it is. It's a, <laughs> listen, the Italians build race cars and airplanes that are more beautiful than anybody else they just <laughs> there's something about the eye that the italian designers have and and you know I'll, I'll give them all the credit in the world and yeah uh but as you and i were discussing lord knows what the price of that kit is gonna be well that might get back to michael Carnaca's question i i think uh i've looked into it a little bit i, I think it's gonna be just a penny shy in, in the United States of uh, 180 bucks. I would suspect. See, my bet was that it'd be like 199.99. Well, I think it's coming under that. The, 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 there's some pre-orders out there now that are like 179.99. I think that's right. Is it? Uh, but you know, you look out on the modeling news, and it's the kit's trying to be all that in a bag of chips. I mean, it's got a photo etch fret, it's got an engine, it's got uh, a normal 30 second scale cockpit configuration it's also got these uh you know these nouveau kind of 3d printed decals yeah i'm i'm curious to see see where this one goes it's uh for for whatever reason it's tends to push the price point 
I don't know if they, I don't know if they're doing it if it, or if it's an artifact in in other geographies based on a business model. I I don't know why, but uh, for some reason their stuff is very expensive for what what you get. Um, they're Sunderland, they're short Sterling, uh, or both things that I want to have, but I haven't bought them. And part of the thing that's held me up on both of them is that they're pricey. Uh, they seem unusually pricey compared to similar quality products from other parts of Europe. And I'm, I suspect that that has something to do with the Italian economy and their laws and exports and stuff like that. I, but it's something unique to, to Italy. The only company that I can think of that's kind of similar is Dora Wings out of the Ukraine. But then again, a lot of their stuff is unusual subjects. And so I suspect that and they're probably better, better kids. Right. Well, part of their pro, part of their issue, door wings. I suspect their pricing is related to the fact that they don't expect to sell huge numbers of items, whereas even Italeri's very, very, very mainstream kit, and you could not get more mainstream than a thirty-second scale MC two hundred two. Is all of their kit. Across the entire range, all of their kits are eye-wateringly expensive sometimes. So, like I said, I, I'm I'm surprised it's not one ninety nine ninety nine. Well, maybe we've changed our answer to Karnaka's question. Maybe. <laughs> well, what do you got? Okay, confession time. I am a, a frustrated architect or architectural builder. Uh, I don't do dioramas, but there is something about not only dioramas, but particularly buildings that, you know, there's an alternate reality where instead of going to law school, I became an architect and concentrated on building architectural models. And so I have more building kits, kits of buildings and partial buildings then I could reasonably justify for a 72nd scale aircraft modeler. So there's a company called RT Diorama that has announced a watermill diorama base in its front part of a European, what looks to be a European watermill, although frankly, it probably would fit in colonial America or, or, or something similar. And it's just really attractive. Uh, part of the reason it's really attractive is whoever they got to build the model that the, the, the model for the photo that they're using to advertise it, it's really well done. And that's, it's just cool. And I can't tell you why, and it doesn't make any sense, but yeah, I I like it. How about you? Well, I got another one. It's a, a set of tracks from uh, ET Models. Okay. It's for the LVT Water Buffaloes. Oh. The 35th scale. Gotcha. Which get, kind of gets back to Itzelary because that's the kit, right? Right. That Unless there's been a new one. I don't. Well, wait a minute. Um, didn't AFV Club? I don't recall. Okay. I'm thinking maybe somebody did, but uh, I, anyway. I, I know so. for the Itzelary kit, the tracks were the hang up. Right. The, the tracks for this vehicle are really fiddly, almost like sheet metal stamped and f fabricated things. They're, they, you know, right. they're not, they're not like tank tracks. Right. Cause they, they're used for swimming as much as they are for, for, uh, driving. Right. So, so these, these are really interesting. And, and I think, who was it? It was, it was one of the VLS companies, Dave Harper. Those guys at the yep. very end, they were doing stuff for the Itulary LVT, and for for about a a millisecond, they had a set of tracks for those things that were, yep. I think, were three D printed. You know, at the very front end of this technology, getting into our hobby, yeah, and uh, would really make the difference on that kit for sure. But uh, uh, these things look, I mean, 
the, the printing technology is going to produce a, a really fine track. And uh, I, I think these, uh, these could be really useful for somebody wanting to build those vehicles. Diorama possibilities for one of those things, just nearly endless. Well, yeah. I mean, they're in every picture of every amphibious landing everywhere. Just yeah. tons of them. Yep. And uh, this is a good opportunity to put some really nice scale size tracks on there that have yep. nice scale fidelity. Yep. Got another one? Yes, I do. Um, Dana Bell, who is going to be on this podcast at some point in the hopefully near term future, he has released a book, the Rivet Counter Guide Number Two Painting the Fleet. It is interwar battleship and cruiser aviation, so it's the float planes of the U.S. fleet between the end of World War One. And the beginning of World War II, which includes all of those wonderful late 20s to 1939 yellow wings, but on yep. the float planes that were catapult launched off of the battleships and the cruisers. Uh oh. Dana's <laughs> knowledge of these subjects is to call it encyclopedic, would be a. a, a damning with faint praise. Uh, And not only that, Dana's written a lot of books, a lot of reference books, and his stuff is so thorough and so well detailed. And this particular subject hits me in all of the right modeling erogenous zones. And (laughs) I have to pick it up. I will be picking up this book, uh, I'm hoping that Dane is going to be at San Marcos. And if he is, I'm going to pick it up from him and get him to autograph it. Uh, I have a ridiculous number of Dana Bell books and luck- I've been lucky enough that he's signed all of them for me. So uh, I'm definitely going to be picking that up. How about you? Uh, my last one's a yawn. Okay. And I'm not sure if it's mini art or the modeling news. Okay. You know, I don't want to be too judgmental. It takes a lot of time and resources to run a website. It yeah. just does, especially when you're updating every day when it's probably not your main gig. Oh, yeah. I, I, for people who aren't aware of it, there's a website called The Bottling News. And every, pretty much every day other than the weekends, they put out, you know, here's a new kit or here's the new releases that this manufacturer has announced. It's a great website. I, I go to it nearly every day. Well, I do go to it every day and what I really like and what I'm always hoping to see is one of their, you know, their big time, it may be not a build review, but a full blown kit expose of yeah. something new right? or some new announcement. And the one that left me wanting more because I really like their substantive posts, right? Yeah. The one that really, really left me wanting more is, is they one day listed Mini Arts box of waiter figures. Now, this this is one of those feels like they phoned it in, right? <laughs> right. Or filler. I mean, we got to get we got to post something today. Here's the new kit. This one's easy because it's easy because we've seen all these figures before because they're the waiter and all the other cafe sets that Mini Arts had over the last year and a half, right? Yep. Uh, but again. Um, it's me. It's not, it's not those guys. I, I don't want to be too harsh. You know, many art can box whatever they want to box and sell their sprues, however they want to sell them. I got no problem with that. Maybe somebody needs four waiters. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, it's for that big dining scene, dining diorama. Of course, then That's again, right. somebody used the pigeons. So, you know, hey, they did. I mean, yep. you could, you could model the uh, IPMS nationals uh, banquet. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Uh, that's just one of those, when I get on modeling news, I'm like, ah, crap, I guess maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. (laughs) There you go. Maybe the big one's tomorrow. You got any more, Dave? I've got one more and, uh, it's a fave and, uh, you're going to like this. You're definitely going to want to check it out. Uh, there is a company called Nautilus Models and they make the transportation trolleys, the wheeled transportation trolleys for the OS2U Kingfisher and the SOC-1 Seagull 
uh, you know, the U.S. Yep. float planes at either pre-war or the beginning of the war. And uh, these are the wheeled transportation trolleys for the for the float planes, um, which would, by the way, make a great display base if you build one. Uh, and I suspect they must be 3D printed because they're offered in uh, all three scales, 32nd, 48th, and 72nd. Uh, and they have the Kingfisher trolley and the Kingfisher slash Seagull trolley. So seems like that seems like a Mike must have. You're going to need to look at that. Well, I'll look at those. Didn't we see him at? Uh, oh, where did we see him at? Uh, Nautilus. Uh, where did we see him? Because he has the catapult section too. Yes, that's right. We did. It was it was in uh, Omaha. Okay. Well then, hopefully, sure. hopefully he'll be in San Marcos, and you you can have a discussion with him. Well, if they look good, I'll buy something. Yeah, well, they look good in the CAD renders. That's all I'm telling you. Getting the right sized base for your model, diorama, or vignette can be difficult and time consuming. Bases by Bill has the solution with their all new custom sized display bases. Offering sizes of 4 to 30 inches, you choose the dimensions you want and get the size you need every time. And they can laser engrave the base with a unit emblem or text all to your specifications. Better still, shipping is included within the lower U.S. 48 states. Built by modelers for modelers, Bases by Bill has bases and display cases for any type of model and for any size. Visit their website at basesbybill.com to see their products or to get your own custom-built base or display case quote. Use the code MOJO at checkout to apply a 15% listener discount to your order. That code again is MOJO for 15% off. Bases by Bill for all your model display needs. Well, Mike, we've come in, come to the end of this hour and 12 minute model sphere or whatever we're calling this thing. Have you gotten toward the end of your modeling fluid? I have, you know, we've had the bullet on here many, many times, but, yep. uh, old reliable, folks, they call her. Well, you know, I've kind of moved off of it to something different. The, uh, the Russell's 10 year. And I, I tell you what, the Russell's 10 years, a, a lot, oh, not a lot, but it's noticeably sweeter than this. Yeah. So when I come back to Bullet now, I'm really getting the spice. Well, you know, if you show up at my house on July 4th, there's a bottle of uh, Russell Tenure sitting here waiting for you. Well, I'll be there. I hope you're ready for these two teenagers to eat me out of house and home. Hey, did the, I have more food than they can possibly consume. My modeling fluid wrap up, just to give pe people peeks behind the way this uh, episode gets recorded, picked up my wife from work and so managed to uh, be back here. And uh, instead of uh, Big K orange soda, I'm actually drinking a Voodoo Ranger Imperial IPA, which is one of my two go-to beers. It's either this or it's Gumball Head. And... Uh, I'm getting ready for a decal session at the bench, so I'm having this, and it's satisfying as usual. This thing is almost wrapped up. We're almost at the end. Do you have any shout-outs that you want to shout out? I've got a couple, and one of them's pretty pretty standard. First up, all the folks who've helped make this show possible through their generosity. Folks such as Drew Oliver, who've joined the ranks of our patrons. We appreciate that. If you'd like to be like Drew, you can do so by going to Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Plastic Model Mojo. There you can make a recurring contribution of any amount from a dollar on up, and uh, they'll handle the month-to-month -month billing for that. If you want to manage your own contribution or do a one-and-done, you can do that through PayPal www.plasticmodelmojo.com in the upper right hand corner of our page there is a heart icon that will take you to our PayPal portal and you can uh, do whatever you want to do there and we certainly appreciate it. Um, you've made a lot of things happen for us and uh, makes us want to deliver during our adversarial times of uh, trying to get through the month of June. Amen. July <laughs> gotta be better. Well, I'd like to shout out in advance both uh, Jeff Groves and Barry Numeric because uh, 
I'm going to send uh, the two modelers mentioned earlier who contacted us to Jeff and Barry. Um, that Again, this is one of the things that grew out of this podcast that I never expected, wasn't planned for. I mean, when we started this, we didn't know what really would it would be. But one of the great things that has happened from the rise of the community of all the listeners is people reach out. They've got questions. Sometimes I know the answers or sometimes I think I know the answers or, or you know, sometimes I can point them in a direction. But a lot of times it's stuff where, oh, I know who'd be the perfect person to answer that question. And because we're all good modeling friends, because we've all established these tight relationships. You know, I saw Barry at Wonderfest. I saw Jeff Groves at Indianapolis. I know that I can shoot them an email and hook them up with these folks asking questions. And they're going to get high quality information and something that really makes their hobby better. And, you know, when we started this, I didn't expect that at all. It's a great benefit. I'm not getting anything out of this other than hooking up somebody with a question to a person who I consider an expert and a great modeler and knows the answer. So what I get out of it is a rush of, hey, I've got somebody connected up and they're going to get what they need to make their hobby better. So shout out to both Barry and to Jeff Groves, because I I appreciate in advance the help you're going to give the listeners. Dave, my other one is Burbank's House of Hobbies. It sounds like it sounds like they got good, good uh, customer service. They're getting stuff out on time. Uh, Dave, it's Cali Delex in three days of me submitting my order. You know, that is just amazing. Do you remember doing squadron mail order? The oh, old yeah. the old two, way where you'd fill out the weeks. form and mail it in? <laughs> Had to wait for your check to clear and then, right. then they'd send you stuff. Well, not anymore. Burbank's House of Hobbies brings their A game every time I order from those guys. And uh, I sent them a little thank you email today. And, you know, here, I ordered the stuff what, three days ago, three days ago, Friday. I got it Friday. So yeah. tu- Tuesday. Yeah. I-, I modeled on the catapult last weekend, Sunday and a little bit Monday and was like, yeah, it's sitting going where I want. I need some different colors. Uh, I knew they could get it. I knew, I knew from prior orders that if, if they had it, I would have it by the weekend, the yeah. next weekend when I would have time to get back on it again. And, uh, say, you know, no surprise. There it was in the mailbox. Uh, guys, Burbank's House of Hobbies, we appreciate it. I appreciate the service. It's, uh, I highly recommend these guys for, uh, for all your modeling needs. If you're going to order it, mail order, give them a, give them a look out. Give them a look. Hey, listen, I, I am all for one of the great things we do have the ability to do with this podcast is tell listeners who the really great vendors are, uh, uh, you know, who the, who the great, folks that we interact with and purchase from and you know it, it's good to let them know hey these guys are really on it these guys have great prices or these guys man you order and they are on top of it retail is a hard business i mean selling is a hard business and when you're doing it right you deserve some recognition so i'm happy to to see a shout out folks like that you got anything else dave No, Mike, I think we're about at the end, buddy. All right, man. Well, as we always say, Dave. So many kits. So little time, and I will see you on the 4th of July at your pool. You got it. Can't wait. (laughs) 